All right, we're um, pleased to be here. Thank you for uh, being here at 9 a.m., uh, getting the best seats in the house, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for this talk. Uh, we're, we're, Sharon and I are going to be doing something very different uh, in this presentation uh, in an effort to, uh, you know, give you some reward, uh, hopefully some substantial reward, or perhaps some performance award uh, for being here. So uh, I'm going to be doing something which I I'm not very good at it. I'm going to be trying to stand still uh, and, and read, basically. So, are we ready? Yeah. All right. Good morning. I'm here to talk about a topic that is near and dear to my heart and mind, trade secrets. Since originally submitting the idea and initial title for this talk, the title is now, What Trade Secret Law Might Teach? In the grand tradition of Larry Lessig, I'm going to explain what trade secret law might teach us all. Sharon Sandine is going to be my anger translator. <laughs> teach? Do you think it is possible to teach anything about trade secret law when everyone is so focused on other areas of IP? Don't you know this is other related IP and soft IP? Nobody cares about trade secret law. View me as a trade secret medium. A much, much less productive Mark Lindley, if you will. <laughs> Why is it important to consider what trade secret law might teach? For one, over the past three years, there's been a noticeable increase in the rhetoric surrounding trade secret policy in this country. Among other recent initiatives, proposals have been introduced in Congress, Japan, and in the EU for the adoption of new trade secret laws. That can't be a coincidence. Somebody or some interest, industry must be behind this. Aren't these the same governments that, that push for trips? Now they're pushing for greater trade secret protection. Something must be going on, and I suspect it's not about trade secrets. Another reason that it's important to consider what trade secret law might teach is because it has a history that is grounded in principles of free competition and information diffusion. That, as we know, provide important counterweights to claims for even greater IP protection. Also, trade secret claims, like all IP claims, are torts. Thus, when considering trade secret policy, and more broadly, information and IP policy, we should not lose sight of a basic feature of tort liability. We do not provide a cause of action or a remedy for all wrongs and harms that might befall an individual or a business. What are these people thinking? You mean I cannot sue someone for touching me? while I'm walking down the street or otherwise disrespecting my space? Come on! What if my feelings were hurt or germs were transferred? Ha. Having developed out of common law, trade secret law can demonstrate how IP torts can be defined and limited so as to address some wrongs and harms, but not all. Generally, four facts must be proven before tort liability will attach. First, a wrong. Second, some degree of intent or knowledge. Third, causation, and four, actual harm. Unfortunately, the elements of various IP torts, including trade secret misappropriation, are less clear than they should be, particularly when it comes to causation and the need to connect wrongdoing to a measurable harm. It's about time that we start focusing on the tort law foundations of trade secrecy and other forms of IP. Property, property, property. John Locke is probably rolling in his grave to think that the policymakers of today talk so much about labor and incentive theory. All of you know, or all of you should know, that people cannot invent and create if they are not educated or do not have access to up-to-date and reliable information. Plus, a focus on property theory does not change the fact that property claims are torts. Myriad of torts revealed. A wrong can be defined in a number of ways, sometimes focusing on the act of the defendant and sometimes focusing on the mindset of the defendant, but usually with aspects of both. But wrongdoing alone, even with a high degree of intent, 
is usually not enough to impose tort liability. In the case of trade secrecy, it is the loss of trade secrecy or the unauthorized use of trade secrets which creates a potential for actual harm. The mere existence of an ownership or property right in the corpus is a prerequisite to the cause of action. But without actual harm, there's little reason for a court or the law to intercede. Yeah, where's the beef? And I don't care if you're too young to know <laughs> If there's no harm, what's the problem? I can give you an entire list of theories and arguments that were made to expand tort liability only to be shot down due to the absence of a perceived wrong or measurable harm. Do you remember the debates about negligent infliction of emotional distress? And what about the tort, one of my favorites, of bad faith denial of the existence of the contract? I have a problem living in a country that won't give a grieving mother a remedy just because her child was run over out of view, but will give IP owners expansive remedies just because they labored to create something new. The first lesson, and that is as condescending as it sounds, trade secret law can teach IP law about the value of inquiry into actual harm and how tort claims can easily be abused and become punitive without such a requirement. During the debates that led to the Uniform Trade Secret Act, the drafters directly confronted an important question about harm and available remedies in a way that recognized the potential anti-competitive effects of trade secret liability. At issue was the so-called perpetual injunction. The drafters of the UTSA opted to prohibit perpetual injunctions because they viewed them to be a penalty rather than as a means to prevent further harm. Yeah, what gets me mad is that when individuals are given greater leeway to sue businesses, those businesses get all up in arms and yell, tort reform, tort reform. But where is the outrage when the same businesses want to make it easier to sue individuals and small businesses for IP infringement and thereby kill competition? Even in cases where there is some harm, what is worse for society? Not giving a remedy in the case of nominal or not marginal harm or preventing others from competing. Merely labeling IP as a form of property only gets us so far in the analysis, as illustrated by the simple fact that there are a variety of different property claims. The more important question with respect to IP claims is whether we want the requisite elements to be more akin to trespass to real property or trespass to chattels. Yes. And I know the difference between property rules and liability rules. But what I'm concerned about is the grant of liability <coughs> remedies for property wrongs and property remedies for speculative harm. If we are going to grant such remedies while we're at it, why don't we treat wrongs, uh, why don't we treat moral rights and geographical indications of origin like real property wrongs? Are we slouching toward ignoring the nature of the harm? Well, some may wish to treat IP rights more like real property, whereby any trespass is actionable. Historically, we haven't gone that far. In the case of trade secrets, it must be shown that identifiable trade secrets were wrongfully acquired, disclosed, or used with the requisite mindset and in a manner that caused the plaintiff actual harm. If we now want to treat some IP rights as like real property instead of personal property, and not require proof of actual harm, or in the case of injunctive relief, threatened harm, we have several challenges. Here's one. Without the requirement of harm, our civil justice system would be like an episode of Judge Judy on steroids. All these businesses would come before the court claiming that their IP was touched, moved, or disrespected, looking for some kind of payout. Hold it. That is what we already have, isn't it? What a waste of resources, not to mention a hindrance to innovation and entrepreneurship. When we create a new tort or make it easier to prove an old one, we may provide plaintiffs with a more powerful cause of action, but we also create a situation where there are more potential defendants. We give plaintiffs a new way to threaten others through the demand letter, which we have seen is very effective in chilling all kinds of activity in copyright and other IP areas. Trade secret doctrine can teach us about the societal cost of that kind of action 
and companies that are subjected to weaker baseless claims and ways to limit those costs. <clears throat> the history of the UTSA reveals that the drafters wanted to make it easier for trade secret owners to protect their legitimate trade secrets, but in a way that would not lead to an increase in illegitimate and anti-competitive claims. Thus, important limitations were built into the UTSA <clears throat> that should not be ignored and may need to be expanded. What happened? What happened in this country? We used to protect free competition. Teddy Roosevelt is probably spitting in his grave just thinking about all the time and energy he tried, he spent busting trust a hundred years ago. Don't you see the parallels? Now it seems that we want to allow anyone, or at least big business interests that give lots of campaign contributions, the right to stymie competition in the name of protecting IP rights. And don't get me started on the, about the use of trade secrets to stymie government, government transparency, employability, or entrepreneurship. Are we building a secret society where the masses are just destined to work in the same job forever? In thinking about the limitations that should be imposed upon the scope and enforcement of IP rights, one problem in particular stands out. The difficulty of defining the precise parameters of the asserted property rights. Indeed, many of the problems related to IP rights today, including the patent troll problem, or non-practicing entity, or patent, or patent assertion entity, or whatever term you want to use, the confusing test for copyright infringement, the over-assertion of trademark rights, can be traced directly to the difficulty of defining the meets and bounds of those rights. Therefore, we have a second lesson. Trade secret law can teach that when dealing with intangible IP rights, it is important that the putative IP owner be required to specifically identify the rights that it claims both before and during litigation. Only in this way can alleged infringers and misappropriators be put on effective notice of potentially wrongful behavior. Yeah, if a person does not know where IP rights begin and end, how could they be expected to respect them? In some cases, including trade secret misappropriation, you can be thrown in jail for not guessing right. Really? What torts are based upon property rights, an essential element of tort requires the plaintiff to prove the existence and parameters of the asserted property right. This naturally shifts the focus of litigation from the alleged wrongdoing, what often motivated right, the creation of the tort in the first place, to the existence or non-existence of the property right. Thus, a lot of money can be saved if lawsuits are not allowed to proceed without sufficient and hopefully early proof of wrongdoing that caused actual harm. Yes, move the harm analysis up. We have historically been afraid to extend tort liability uh, where there is harm because we are afraid in some cases that the harm is not real. And by the way, competition is not harm. Having employees leave their former employers to start new and oftentimes better businesses is the American way. Haven't you seen the Dodge Brothers commercial? You haven't? Being able to articulate a law that goes beyond the assertion of what amounts to a real property trespass has very important policy and practical implications for IP law. Significantly, although the demarcation of property rights may not be clear, the definition of wrongdoing and harm can be. In effect, these extra elements can act to ameliorate the effects of fuzzy property boundaries. This is particularly important with respect to the definition of crimes, since constitutional principles require the criminal statute to not be vague. Can you imagine a world where you're held liable even though the property lines of asserted property <coughs> rights are unclear? Wrongful behavior is ill-defined and can change at the whim of the property owner, and actual harm need not be shown. It sounds like The Stranger by Albert Camus, or a prosecution under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. <laughs> Ironically, another adverse consequence of the use of property rights as a proxy for wrongdoing and harm is that it may be more difficult to prove the commission of a tort or crime because the existence of a property right is a predicate fact. If the law focuses on the alleged wrongful acts and harms rather than the alleged property rights, society may not have more success in preventing unwanted behaviors. The Federal Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, although imperfect, which is an understatement, is an example of a statutory law which focuses on the acts of wrongdoing more so than the mere existence of property rights. Therefore, we have a third lesson. 
Trade secret law can teach that there is more than one way to structure a civil claim to believe than a hyper-focus on property rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that CFA is, CFAA is awful. Let's put that aside. I have other problems. When we look at everything through a property lens, it distorts our vision. Show me a company that is concerned about trade secret misappropriation, and I will show you a company that copied someone else at some point in time. That is the nature of free competition, and it is generally good. If someone can make a better mousetrap, so be it, with limited exceptions to spur innovation and creativity, of course. So we have a fourth <laughs> lesson. What trade secret law can teach is that the elements of a tort claim, together with other limitations, can be used to achieve the proper balance between fair competition on one hand and unfair competition on the other. Such features might also be used to differentiate between the various forms of IP protection and force individuals and companies to rely more upon patent and copyright protection than trade secret protection, where the requirement for information diffusion is more explicit. Now, we all know what the patent bar and judges have done to patent law. Where, but where there is no explicit quid pro quo, as there is no explicit quid pro quo in trade secret, Arguably, there is a greater need to prove a wrongful act and harm. Otherwise, trade secret owners or sim uh, owners of similar IP-like rights are getting a lot of a lot with little contribution to society. In summary, trade secret law and policy has much to teach about information and IP policy. And now I'm going to channel my rabbi. By recalling the foundation, this is me acting, by the way. By recalling the foundation, I am not a rabbi, the foundation, and I apologize, my rabbi, for having said it. By recalling the foundational principles of tort law and using the elements of a claim under the UTSA as a model, we might begin to more clearly define IP wrongs in ways that the general public can understand, the end result being more compliance and less litigation. This is an early stage work in progress. So we welcome your comments. Yes. Don't leave. Yes, we welcome your comments. So give us our com your comments, please. Yeah. So the trade secret is not a proper right. It's the closest other, I guess, um, theory, right, is a breach of confidential, confidential relationship. And that tort that appears to have expanded, at least in California, already quite, quite a bit. So I'm curious what you think about the connection to that tort, that that's the, the whole view, right, the connection to that tort and what it means for a trade secret. <clears throat> we, we, we were just talking about this this morning. So what happened, so the breach of confidentiality tort, which still exists in the UK and Canada and Australia and New Zealand and so forth, and that's where the trade secret tort in the US came from, focuses on wrongful disclosure and use. What happened is we created this third category, wrongful acquisition, which is built into the UTSA. But what we really didn't think about is how the, how, how the harm from those different acts is different. And so what you have is people in trade secret cases bring a, a claim for wrongful acquisition, but the trade secret is never disclosed or used. So where's the harm? And that's what happened in the Alinikov case, which I'm, you know, I've kind of alluded to. In yes, yes. The so, very interesting. I'm wondering about how this might affect takings doctrine for trade secret, because Ruckelhaus is the case that tells us, you know, the intangibles and trying to figure out how to draw an analogy to trademark, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, and I wonder if by focusing more on the court liability and the harm, it decreases the likelihood that a takings claim would be successful or appropriate. Um, and how that would impact other forms of intellectual property that are going to be learning these lessons. Do you want to take the first shot? Okay. Great, great point. Uh, yes, I think there is an impact there, right? If the you know embedded assumption in a proper takings claim is that there was a presumption that there would be a certain degree of confidentiality, and we move away from that construct, which in which in theory we are, we are in, in a sense uh, encouraging by virtue of this analysis, the result could be that there is a decreased expectation of that kind of secrecy that we otherwise presume. So that would be, that's my initial challenge. Well, answer. my point is, yeah. is that case is always often misread, okay? Because it does not stand for the general principle that, uh, that trade secret misappropriation or 
taking of trade secret is a is an appropriate trade secrets claim. In that case, there there was a gov uh, uh, investment bank expectation that was created by government statute, and so people re misread that case all the time and, and overstate it, particularly if they have the property view of IP and they want to promote that property view. Will and then. Uh, I want to explain a little bit more what you mean by talking about damages earlier. I had a little trouble following that, that in part because um, you know, oftentimes that's information that's held by the defendant. I mean, you're talking about factor damages, you're talking about amount of damages. Well, let me uh, comment on this. I can do it in the context of patent. The best example would be, right, you spend all this effort doing a Markman hearing and very expensive uh, experts and so forth. If, if you actually, like, just assume there was a, a valid patent and there was infringement and just looked at damages, the case might resolve a lot earlier and with less expense. So I think there's benefit in all of the areas of IP to look at the harm issue earlier in the process because sometimes you've, you, you spend so much money fighting um, and, and the statistics from AIPLA for all IP um, are half a million and more. Um, and then there's no actual provable damages. And I'll just add quickly, well, I think, you know, part, a broad animating point here is the presumption of harm which is coming up in the discussion of the new <coughs> efforts to create a federal civil cause of action of the Defense Trade Secret Act. There's a, which, which we didn't allude to directly here, but really is, I think it's coloring both of our analysis. There is an, an increasing embedded assumption that the mere acquisition of a trade secret immediately creates a harm. Right now, we, th that's an interesting point too, to the extent that trade secrets use an R and D. But the point is, what Sharon is making is that we need to know that early on in the litigation before we go forward. And so, you want? Yeah. Okay. We'll talk. Thank you very much.